Welcome to a special program with Pete Buttigieg and Barkari Sellers. My name is Asha Guha, and I'm delighted to partner with the Commonwealth Club and Inforum on a new speaker series, Ideas Inspire. Our goal is to inform, engage, and inspire youth to be empowered citizens of tomorrow. As part of the series, we're delighted to welcome students from all over the barrier today. I'd like to take a moment to recognize students from Foothill Community College, Eastside College Prep, and the Science Internship Program at UC Santa Cruz. Today, we'll be hearing from former South Bend Mayor, Pete Buttigieg, and former South Carolina State Representative, Barkari Sellers. Both our speakers have dedicated their life to public service from a very young age. Their lives are a testament to the transformative power of young leaders to shape a better future for all of us. It is our hope that the students joining us today will be inspired by Pete and Barkari to actively engage in their communities and support democratic ideas and institutions. If you would like to ask a question of either of our speakers today, please do so by entering it in the chat or comment section of the live stream you're watching. We'd also like to encourage our students to submit questions as well. We hope you'll consider donating to the Commonwealth Club to support our virtual programs and our efforts to engage students. If you'd like to learn more about the club and its virtual programs, please visit us at commonwealthclub.org slash online. Now, please join me in welcoming Pete Buttigieg and Barkari Sellers to Inforum. Oh man, it's glad. I am really, really excited to be here with everybody today. Hello and welcome to today's virtual program uh, with Inform at the Commonwealth Club. I'm former South Carolina State Representative Bakari Sellers. We got a lot of formers here, Pete. I guess we need to go get a new job. Everybody's a former. I'm excited to be in conversation with my good friend, Pete Buttigieg, author of the new book, which I have over my shoulder, Trust, America's Best Chance. As we all know, Pete is the former mayor of South Bend, Indiana a 2020 Democratic presidential candidate, a Rhodes Scholar, a Navy veteran. Pete was educated at Harvard and Oxford University. I'm really happy to have Pete here today. Just a reminder, if you want to ask Pete a question about absolutely anything in the world, because nothing's going on right now. We know that, right? Uh, but if you'd like to ask him a question, please submit uh, it in the YouTube chat. Uh, Pete, welcome back to Inform, man. It's good to see you. Thanks, Bakari. Really good to see you. Thanks for doing this. And uh, it uh, warms my heart to see your I Voted sticker reminding us that it's uh, election season, not just uh, election day coming up. So uh, that's great to see. And uh, thanks so much to the Commonwealth Club and Inform for hosting us. Yeah, definitely. I, I masked up and went down and, and waited in line. The lines are crazy throughout. So uh, shout out to everyone uh, running for office uh, and making history. So I wanted to start on something that's near and dear to my heart. I believe it to be um, near and dear to yours as well. You had a chance to meet and talk to Congressman John Lewis before he passed away. Um, what did you take from his life experience as it relates to the issue that you delve into, the thesis of your book, Trust for Communities, um, and how that sometimes is too often left out of the equation that we deal with on a daily basis? Yes, uh, you know, I've been thinking a lot about uh, uh, the, the legacy and the lessons of Representative Lewis. Getting to know him better during the course of the campaign was uh, one of the most moving experiences. And I write about the fact that, as chance would have it, my last day as a candidate, pretty much the last thing I did in public uh, before we headed home to South Bend to, to end the campaign, uh, was participating in that march at Selma, commemorating the, uh, the incredible courage of, uh, of him and those who were with him on the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And uh, he came and joined those who were uh, uh, marking the occasion. We didn't know he'd be there because we knew he was ill. Uh, but he stepped out, a car materialized, he came out and, and he told everybody there, and his voice even then was resonating, uh, telling us to use the, the power of the vote as a nonviolent instrument or tool to, to redeem the soul of the nation, I think was how, how he said it. And it was such a stirring moment. And I wrestled in the book with exactly how best to write about the role of trust in uh, that, uh, that period in the 1950s and 60s, uh, when he and others were 
uh, marching to make America a democracy and you know, doing it in a way that I think revealed a tremendous amount of trust. Uh, there was not trust, of course, in the, uh, the good faith of the institutions they were trying to change. They knew exactly what was waiting for them as state troopers were, were ready with, with violent intent on the other side of that bridge. But there was a level of trust in each other, trust in their solidarity, and I think trust in the capacity of the system to be reformed when confronted with a demand. That's something we ought to remember now as I speak to a lot of young people who are uh, uh, rightly frustrated with the system saying, why should I even bother to vote? Why should I be part of a system that, that, that is broken in so many ways? And, and invite them to consider the power they have to make it less broken if and only if they use the power that comes with the ballot. You know, when I tell people often what's the greatest currency we have in, in politics, I, I learned a lesson from the South Carolina State Capitol. I would always tell people and everyone listening that the greatest uh, currency you have in politics is not how much money you, you raise, but the relationships that you build. Um, but that, those relationships, they rely on trust. So talk to me um, when you're writing this book about what it means. Let's look globally, kind of take a step back and talk about what it means. And even more importantly, why does it matter? Because to be honest with you, I mean, you can win the White House. And nobody trusts the thing coming out of your mouth, as we've seen in recent history. So talk to me about what does it mean and why does it matter? Yeah, so uh, the reality is nothing works if we don't have a basic level of trust. The simplest transactions in our lives, you go to a restaurant, you're trusting that they're not going to poison you, and they're trusting that uh, you're going to wait until you've paid up before you leave. Uh, we, uh, it's often in unseen ways that trust plays such an important role. Uh, if uh, you know, I write about uh, some of the experiences in Afghanistan that made me really think about uh, being able to trust those around me, but, but in less dramatic ways. We do this every minute. Every time you, you, you go through a green light, you're trusting your life to the idea that the person waiting at red is going to obey the traffic light on their side. And of course, this is true in political, uh, the political arena and definitely true in the international arena. Uh, consider the fact that we're confronted right now with a virus that uh, really won't be beat unless we can trust one another to do the things that are needed to protect ourselves and each other, to wear a mask, for example. In fact, public health often depends on whether people trust the medical advice that they're getting. And I was especially disturbed to see statistics suggesting that as many as half of Americans uh, are not sure they would get a vaccine even if one was approved. If that, if that proves out, then we'll never beat this pandemic. And so there are real direct life or death consequences to whether we have that level of trust, political trust in our leaders, social trust in each other to get through life and to confront big problems around us. And that's why I wanted to write this book. And that's why I, I uh, wanted to write it quickly and, and, and have it come out before the election, because I think these are some of the questions that should be on our mind as we go into this, uh, this voting season that, that's now underway. Uh, what can we do to make sure that we hold leaders accountable, uh, that we demonstrate that we expect a level of trustworthiness from them? And how do we build up those relationships that are not direct in-person, in-the-room relationships, but are still intimately important, like the relationship that each of us has to the people who make decisions over our lives, everywhere from the Supreme Court to the to City Hall? You know, you, you bring up something fascinating, and I'm almost finished with the book. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal read, and as someone who's written a book, for you to write that book this depth, this touching, this personal, this meaningful, that quick. Uh, is a testament to uh, chast and ghostwriting for you, but I digress. Um, what did you learn about trust while you were on the campaign trail? I, I, what lessons, because people always, I mean, look, you, you were mayor of South Bend, Indiana. You announced that you were running. I remember you were running for uh, uh, chair of the DNC. You announced you're running for president of the United States. Uh, you, it wasn't a whole, you didn't have a whole team of people. It was you and our good friend, uh, the savant, communication savant, Liz Smith. And then I pop up and you're on The View and on TMZ Live. She, there was not a TV screen or an interview that she shied you away from. But talk to me about the trust, not just with the team around you, because we didn't see any of those leaks or things fall apart. Um, we saw you were very well prepared going into debates and proposals and platforms. Talk to me about trust and the things you learned on the campaign trail. 
Yeah, it's a huge part of campaigning, and, and I think maybe even more so when you're campaigning young. And, and uh, I enjoyed your account of that experience in, in, uh, in your book, My Vanishing Country, how you establish those, those relationships. Because when you're asking somebody to vote for you, especially when you're running for president, but really for any office, in many ways, you're asking them to trust you with their lives. They're asking, you're asking them to trust you with the lives of their loved ones. And there, there's something very serious and, and very intimate about that. And the best thing that you can do is to try to help them know you. Think about the people in your life that you would trust with, a, uh, uh, with something very confidential or with a, uh, something very important or just something intimate, like looking after your, your, your house or, 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 your, uh, or your kids while you're away. Uh, more than anything, you want to feel like you know them. So what does it mean to know somebody to where we can trust them? Well, a lot of it's being able to see how they act and, and uh, decide whether it's predictable or not. You know, the word predictable has a lot of negative connotation, right? Because uh, predictable means boring, but also predictable means I can count on you. And I think that that's uh, something that we're really lacking right now in, in the political space, right? The, the president seems to think it's uh, a strategy to be unpredictable. Uh, and I don't know that that's a strategy or not. Uh, maybe it's just an excuse, but whatever it is, it's extremely destructive of the possibility of trusting anybody because what you learn on the campaign is people want to know you're going to be the same person tomorrow uh, that you were yesterday, that you're going to be the same person in office, that you were uh, on the trail when you were asking for their vote. And uh, uh, often you're asking people to make a down payment of trust uh, before they know for sure how you're going to act, which after all is what trust is all about. Because if we all acted in predictably certain, perfectly upstanding ways all the time, trust would disappear as a concept. It wouldn't even make sense. We wouldn't need it. Trust matters because we're not always sure uh, what to expect of one another. And so we have to form our expectations, make ourselves vulnerable to what somebody else is going to do, uh, whether you're telling them a secret or uh, trusting them with political power. Uh, and that's the experience that really an election, I think, exchanges. I mean, the election is maybe the greatest exchange of trust we have in our civic life. Uh, uh, we, as citizens, are trusted to make uh, decisions of incredible importance over who's going to lead us. Uh, and, uh, and in turn, uh, we expect those leaders to be trustworthy when we give them that assignment. Do you remember the times when you could forget who the president was for like two, three weeks at a time? You know, just four years ago, you didn't have to really worry. You could just. Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah, trust. Do you remember? You didn't have to look at, you didn't have to stay up and look at Twitter all night. Uh, so that I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Talk to people just briefly, because one of the unique experiences you have, uh, my good friend, Steve Benjamin, uh, 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 Frank Scott, Randall Wilson, Keisha Lance Bottoms, London Breed. Uh, they all, you all all have this unique executive experience. In fact, y'all probably wouldn't make the best legislators because y'all can't be one of 30, 435. You want to be one of one. A different animal. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different animal. Talk to me about the difference in, in, in these uh, relationships and understanding trust from your perch as being mayor versus that of being a part of a legislative body. I mean, especially to the students that are watching, trying to figure out where their political career takes them. Um, talk yeah. about that difference. Well, I think uh, one of the biggest things about being an executive is you don't have a peer group. By definition, there's only one mayor, at least in your city. Hopefully you get to know your counterparts. Uh, and, and I've loved getting to know uh, some of the mayors you, you just named. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, th there's only one mayor and uh, there's only one governor, there's only one president. When you're in that executive role, uh, the role of trust is huge because it's just a different feel from being in a committee room where people are testing different ideas, seeing what's convincing, uh, poking each other a little bit. Um, you have to rely so much on the team around you. You have to rely on them to be telling you the truth. You have to rely on them to tell you things you might not want to hear in order to help you make a good decision. You're relying on them to challenge you if you're going in a direction that, that could be a mistake and you haven't thought about all of the reasons why. And then you're relying on them to go and carry out the decision, whatever it was, even if they'd recommended something else. It's that kind of trust that I think can be formed in a, a swift amount of time when there's a big challenge in front of you. Uh, but everyone from uh, military officers to business leaders to executives in government learns the extent to which you really are, uh, uh, no matter how strong you, you would like to, to view yourself as, uh, you just can't do it uh, alone. And you really are dependent uh, on the competence and the integrity of the people who are around you. Let's go back to your military background. Um, the trust that's involved uh, can you talk about that experience in Afghanistan and war zones? I mean, yeah. um, 
trust has to be something that that is is everywhere. I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't work without that. And compare that to, I mean, we have. I just was on CNN International earlier today, where we have a a wide uh, a wide swath of our Joint Chiefs quarantining right now. Um, so talk about that trust in the military from your experience, and then politically put a lens on it today. Yeah, trust is a huge part of what makes it possible for the military to function. And one of the things I was reflecting on as I wrote the book uh, is how quickly that trust has to be established. So uh, my, my job, I was an intelligence uh, analyst. and In theory, my job was at a computer, but in practice, they wound up uh, needing me to, to do a lot of vehicle runs uh, between Kabul and Bagram or around the city of Kabul, just because I happened to be a rifle, uh, a long gun qualified, and, and, and that was something they needed per protocol to get people can- around. Um, say again you can shoot yeah not not always straight but uh i have to get the badge <laughs> i'm learning i'm learning something new okay <laughs> so uh, you know i don't mean to present you know i wasn't kicking down doors i wasn't a navy seal but but part of my job was was to go outside the wire with the vehicle and, and get people uh safely and alive or get equipment uh safely from point a to point b and I remember thinking about how much I trusted people, you know, when somebody got into my vehicle for the 30th time, the trust that we'd established. But then I started thinking, what about the trust that was there the first time somebody got into my vehicle, not knowing anything about me, what kind of person I was, my personality, all they might know about me was that they'd been assigned to get into the vehicle I was driving and that uh, they could see my rank and my name on my uniform and that was it. And they were gonna trust me with their lives. And of course it was mutual. Um, And what I realized is that we create institutions and structures and and customs in order to place that sort of down payment on trust before it can be validated by the experiences we have. Uh, And that's what training is about. That's what uh, 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 rank is about. Um, But it's also what it's about to be part of a group that has a strong sense of belonging. All All you should have to know about somebody in uniform is to look at the flag on their shoulder and you know that we're part of the same team, even if they've got a different... Uh, political viewpoint than you do, or they're from a different part of the country, or they have a different racial background, whatever it is, you know that you're in it together. And I've thought a lot about what it would take to create that same sense of group belonging for more Americans without more Americans having to have the experience of going to war. I think there are a lot of ways to do that. And we've got to be on the lookout for those sources of group belonging that are not about excluding outsiders, uh, but about creating that sense that we can turn to each other, that you know, you know, whether you're part of a sports team or a a club or a faith community or a political organization or a military unit or whatever it is, uh, can create such important bonds of trust that you can then take out into other contexts and use to build the relationships that we really uh, are lacking in this country. You know, uh, the the number of Americans who say you can trust other people uh, to do the right thing has been falling in almost catastrophic speed. And if we don't shore it back up, uh, we're going to find that the U.S. will become like a lot of low trust societies uh, that do worse economically. They do worse in terms of safety. They do worse in terms of justice. Uh, and that's that's a, a direction we've got to reverse for America to have a good balance of the 21st century. You and I are, are decently young. Uh, you know, I um, was on a call with some students uh, not long ago. And the, the, phrase, the, the way the student phrased the question was, back when you were young and it just it hit the <laughs> soul I was like at 36 back when I was young um but let me ask you about this emergence of social media um I think when you and I were in college it was probably MySpace um it's emerged to Facebook which you know my mom still gets her news from uh now we we merged over into Instagram uh with a bit of Snapchat and now all my teenage, I have a 15 year old teenage daughter, all she does, she knows more TikTok dances than she does any curriculum that she's being taught. Um, but with this emergence of social media, do you think that there is um, some, or this increase in online presence, do you think that it's eroding the fabric of trust in our communities or is it enhancing? I mean, how do you, how do you jive what we're doing online, um, especially with the new generation, Generation Z coming up? Yeah. with uh, your theme and thesis of trust. Yeah, I think you and I, as, as the sort of elder millennials, have a unique uh, kind of timing on this, right? Because we got to college and, and things like smartphones and, and, and Facebook, stuff like that, 
uh, didn't exist. And, and by the time we, we uh, were done with our education, all of those things did exist and, and we're starting to dominate our lives. And so we, we've kind of seen both sides of it. Uh, one of the things I did for the book was go back to some of the literature in the nineties when, and it's amazing. If you go back and read, you know, Wired Magazine or some of these places, there's a lot of talk about how, you know, the digital nation is going to be fact-based. Uh, you're not going to see all this uh, uh, kind of dogmatic talk. It's going to be all about reality uh, and positively gushing about the possibilities and of course, unfortunately, we know it, it got a lot darker than that a lot quicker. Misinformation yeah. was able to spread and be monetized so quickly. And, uh, and there's no question that the, the information bubbles that are created and then, and then uh, hardened by social media are one of the reasons why we're having trouble even trusting that we live in the same reality, which, which is incredibly dangerous. I also, though, think that we may have underestimated the ways in which technology can help us cut across those bubbles if, if we're smart about it. It's one of the reasons why uh, I do go everywhere I can on TV. It's not just, uh, uh, you know, uh, TMZ in addition to political media, but, uh, you know, any chance I get, I think later today I'll be doing it. I'll, I'll, I'll do MSNBC and Fox sometimes within the same hour to try to make sure that I'm sharing the same message to very different audiences. Uh, and we've got to find as many ways of doing that uh, as we can. It's been more of a mixed, I think right now we're thinking about all the harm that's been done by social media, but the other side of the coin is it's also changed our ability to, to uh, learn what's happening around the world. Another uh, piece I found of, of writing in the 1990s uh, uh, was about how as more people were able to film their own videos, uh, human rights abuses would be easier to document and to identify. Now, the writer was thinking about the, the former Soviet Union, but uh, here in the United States, especially when it's come to police violence against black mm -hmm. people, we've seen the role that uh, smartphones and social media have played uh, in corroborating experiences a lot of black Americans have been talking about the whole time. Um, but where they were not trusted, people had to trust their own eyes looking at what happened. And so I think, you know, the, the, these technologies, their effect, we're still very early in being able to assess the, the, the extent to which it's done good and the extent to which it's done harm. What we know is that this is a new reality. It's not going away. And the ultimate solutions to how to make sure it does more good than harm aren't about the technology. They're about us and how smart we can be as tough customers and smart consumers of the kind of information and misinformation that gets thrown our way through these technological media. You know, I, I want to just take a moment real quick and, and remind folks, one, you can ask questions via the YouTube chat because this is a fun conversation. I'm recalling back when I taught at the Institute of Politics for our good friend David Axelrod, and I, I challenged my students at the university. One week, they had to watch 30 minutes of um, Morning Joe, the next week they had to watch 30 minutes of New Day, and the next week they had to watch 30 minutes of Fox and Friends. Very good. So they could kind of imagine. So you being able to go and relay those messages is so funny. People were giving you pure hell when you said you were going on Chris Wallace, you know, just on the Twitter sphere. And it's yeah. like, you got to go, uh, by the way, Twitter's not real, real life, but you got to go out there and you, you have to get your message out and take those questions and uh, entertain different ways of thought. I, I want to pivot slightly from, you know, we did a lot of background, you, you as mayor and you um, in the military. Um, I do have a question, though, about the moment we're in now. Um, do you think we're at kind of a tipping point when it comes to distrust or mistrust? I don't know. You're the Oxford uh, Road Scholar. Is it distrust or mistrust? Are we at that tipping point with, with yeah. whatever, whichever one it is? I think we could be. Uh, I think it's up to us. And I think uh, a lot depends on the answer to that question. Look, this is the beginning of the 2020s, right? And if the 2020, if the rest of this decade goes the way the first year of this decade went, we're all in trouble because I think a lot of us feel like 2020 has been a long few years. Uh, but uh, I also believe that this decade ahead of us is a deciding decade that could lead to enormous progress if we started to establish a fairer tax code and actually invest in the things that make it possible for people to thrive, uh, to cut poverty, to, to have real uh, uh, infrastructure, to, to invest in education, to, to address health. Um, if this is the decade when we choose to finally uh, wrestle uh, and wrangle down the racial inequities that have been with us for 400 years, if this really could be, uh, as some have called for, a third reconstruction, building on the first one after the Civil War, the second one in the Civil Rights era, if this was the decade that America actually got the job done, if this was the decade that we actually confronted climate change, and it'll have to be because this will 
either this will be one of two things, the decade we failed permanently to deal with climate change or the decade we somehow got on top of it. One of those two things will, will have to come true and we'll know very quickly. So all of this in ways we don't always think about depends on trust. The ability to build uh, enough trust in the possibility of our institutions to reform, to go in and actually do it. The trust we have in science and expertise that will be needed in order to make the kind of decisions and sometimes uh, difficult choices needed to get ahead of the climate crisis. Uh, the amount of trust in a better shared future that's going to be needed uh, for a lot of white Americans to lay aside some of the benefits uh, uh, that exist as a consequence of the racialized inequities that we live in. All of these things uh, are either about to happen or they're about to not happen in a very permanent, painful, and, and devastating way. It's part of why I thought it was so important for this book to come out this year. I want to talk about a specific incident because I think that we, that unfortunately, I think Black people are in a really unique situation that um, blood has to be shed or images have to be shown so that one, um, you can understand the, the distrust that some people have of an institution or a system. Um, and two, ironically, being able to trust in what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature and try to bring us together. Talk to me about the George Floyd case in that eight minutes and 46 seconds and how it took that for uh, a lot of white folks to understand the distrust that black people have of this community. Talk to me about that incident, that moment, and how you evaluate that moment as we are coming up on these other series of moments that you talked about. So the, the murder of George Floyd, I think, awakened so many Americans, partly because it, it closed the gap, uh, because everybody saw this horrifying killing uh, uh, literally before our eyes. It, it, it closed this gap between what Black Americans have been saying about uh, the Black experience and what uh, white Americans have uh, considered about how deep it runs. In other words, uh, I, I think what was different this time is a lot of, it, it's not so much defeating the likes of the KKK and the Proud Boys, so that's got to happen, but uh, uh, this was more about an awakening uh, of, of what needs to change among uh, white people who uh, have, uh, who consciously uh, would uh, detest racism, but in so many ways continue to participate in uh, this racialized society that, that, that works to the benefit of white Americans and to the detriment of, of black Americans. And a lot of this, again, has to do with trust, partly in terms of, you know, trust is a resource, uh, just, like, just like financial capital. If you have more of it, you can do more in life. Uh, and black Americans have been systematically distrusted. Uh, uh, you know, we can, we can put a number on how much people are trusted with, with credit ratings. And there's a lot of data about the racial disparities in credit ratings, even for otherwise equally credit worthy people. It's certainly the case in, in what Brian Stevenson has called the presumption of dangerousness and guilt uh, that black men in particular, young black men in particular experience uh, that puts their lives in danger every time they encounter uh, a police officer, but also creates uh, maybe a different kind of pressure just getting through life. Things again that, that, that black writers and voices have been talking about for a long time, but I think the, the pivotal nature of the moment of George Floyd was the, uh, the invitation to uh, so many well-intentioned white people to be not just vaguely sympathetic, but specifically active in trying to do something about it. We're going to get to some uh, student questions momentarily. I just have a, a couple more questions for you. One of the things that I, I really wanted your understanding, because I'm still not there yet, distinguish between trust and faith. Mm. It's a great question, one I've been thinking about a lot. In fact, uh, you could spend all day on Google Translate, putting in a word like trust or faith, translating it into some other language, then translating it back into English and, and, and see what comes back. Uh, not every uh, language has the way we do of talking about trust or confidence or faith. Um, consider the word trusty, uh, which is not quite the same thing as trustworthy, uh, but we have it, that word to refer to the kind of the kind of affection that we have for uh, maybe a pocket knife or, or a friend or a, a trusty steed, right, that we can count on. The, the way we talk about this, I think, reflects the way we think about this, too. And uh, if you look in Scripture, there's a lot about trusting in God. Um, every faith tradition has something about how we trust in a, in a higher power or trust in, a, in an order of things. And I think having that kind of trust, which is intertwined with faith in the spirituals, gives us a better ability to have a level of uh, trust in one another. I'm not saying you got to subscribe to a particular religious tradition in order to experience this, but I think it is clear that 
uh, you know, part of what uh, humanity has been searching for ever since the earliest faith traditions emerged is uh, a basis for uh, some level of, of, of trust in a, in a frightening and, and uncertain world. And uh, we've got to think about the trust that we have uh, in each other through the lens of the trust we can have in, in our place in the world, perhaps our place in the universe. And I think many believers organize our, our understanding of that place according to a faith tradition. But whatever moral tradition you hold to, uh, mm -hmm. I think is a big part of what makes it possible to make that down payment and make yourself a little vulnerable, trusting someone else before they fully earned it. That's, that's brilliant. That gives you, that gives me some, some grounding, some way to think about those words. I mean, especially today, I just, well, you know, at this time period, people are go, going to the polls and we're talking about trust and faith in institutions. Um, you know, I voted yesterday. I'm happy to wear my sticker all day or as long as I can until it won't stick to any more suit coats. Um, <laughs> Are you worried about voter turnout and how that will be affected by the distrust we have in our voting institutions? I, I am not. Uh, I can tell you that black folk particularly have overcome those obstacles to vote for a very long period of time. And the lines that I'm seeing voting for people like Jamie Harrison uh, has been just phenomenal. But tell me your thoughts as we try to kind of look at not just where we are, but look towards the future as well in this conversation. Well, I, I think I'm very encouraged by what's happening right now, but I, I do think we need to stay on guard all the way through Election Day to make sure that uh, people don't give in to messages that are designed to break their faith. Uh, and many of these are targeted at the black community because uh, one party, unfortunately, has decided that it would rather uh, suppress some of these votes than compete for them. Uh, and so, you know, you look at uh, for example, the recent uh, uh, reporting, I think it was British reporting, that showed that uh, millions of black voters were coded in the Trump database uh, in Channel 2016. Four. It was Channel 4. Channel 4, Correct. that's right. Uh, under the word deterrence, uh, that was the goal. Uh, and that, that desire for people not to exercise that right, uh, the desire to break down that trust, to me, that's just evidence of how important and valuable that trust is. And another thing I explore in the book are, are the Rus Russian misinformation efforts, not just the ones we've all read about and heard about with the attacks on Hillary Clinton's campaign, but uh, things like the way that Russian social media accounts would actually push uh, both pro-vaccine information and anti-vaccine misinformation out at the same time because they were trying to create, uh, their goal was just controversy itself, not to push uh, a one point of view over the other, but to create an overall sense of doubt. We're seeing that again, and we're gonna see that from sources foreign and domestic, and we've got to be on guard uh, around it. But, but as you say, uh, the, the, the groundswell of energy we've got right now is extremely encouraging. Then of course, what's gonna matter so much uh, if all goes well, at least well by, I, I think, what you and I would consider to be a good outcome on election day, now we've got to deliver. And it's one of the reasons why it will be very important for those who are elected to act swiftly and boldly to make people's lives better. Because that, that, that trust uh, that's already been beaten up and battered, uh, to have that trust expressed in the ballot box, uh, that's going to need to pay dividends quickly in order for uh, there to be a virtuous cycle that will build more and more trust. Otherwise, uh, disappointment will make it harder than ever the next time around. Let me, I have two questions. The, the one I got to get to, the, the other I want to ask right now. Um, the president has, has just, the, the words that will be synonymous with this term, with his tenure as president have been fake news. I mean, he's talked about it from the beginning. I, I don't want to harp on the, the bad politics of it, et cetera, but talk to me about how it erodes the trust coming from the highest office in the land in our institution of media and journalism, which is a necessary institution. How do you rebuild that um, post? Donald yeah, you know, one of the one of the patterns that are in changes that I trace is, you know, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, if Walter, Cron Walter Cronkite would literally end his news broadcasts by saying, that's the way it is. It was his sign off. And there was a, an expectation that certainly broadcast media uh, could give you a clear sense of what had happened. And then there were still politics around it. There were ferocious controversies over what was reported in the news. Uh, but no one would think to say that thing that you saw, you didn't actually see. There's that song, right? Don't believe your lying eyes. Uh, nobody thought of that. They just uh, would argue over the same set of facts. And people would have different values that would uh, lead them to make different conclusions or your diff different interests that would lead you in a different direction. But those different interests, those different values, those were, those were being negotiated on a single field of fact. Now, 
fast forward to 2020, the facts haven't changed. There's still a set of things that either happened or didn't happen, and, and, and the truth is out there. But it is increasingly viewed as acceptable to attack an unfavorable news story by saying, no, that just that didn't happen and calling it fake news. And let's remember the origin of fake news actually was something very different, which was news that was not really designed to get people to believe in it for longer than it took to get you to click on it. But when you clicked on it, somebody made money. There were Macedonian teenagers who could make tons of money by putting up a, a, a story that you'd see in your ad stream that would say, uh, I don't know, Britney Spears has been devoured by alligators. And just out of curiosity, you'd click on it. Uh, and uh, you wouldn't go through life believing it, but they'd make a couple of cents every time somebody did that. And they're some pretty rich Macedonian teenagers because that's how fake news got started, uh, or at least fake, how fake news came into our vocabulary. Now, I actually have a colleague at the University of uh, Notre Dame who's uh, been discussing how a different uh, uh, conception of fake news goes back to the colonial days. And you know, I've got to think that if I was walking down the street in the 17th century and you handed me a, a, a sheet of a pamphlet, a political maybe pamphlet that had been printed on a printing press, I probably would have been a little bit impressed that, that you had a printing press. And I would have thought, well, I better, I better at least look at what this, what this is, right? Then eventually we wised up and we, uh, we had that expression, don't believe everything you read, right? I think we don't have that same wisdom yet when it comes to all the stuff that bombards us on the internet. And so paradoxically, even though everybody can be their own reporter today, we actually need journalism more than we used to. More than ever. Because there's more information, we need more editors and reporters, not to, just to figure out what the little bits of information are out there, but to make sense of them. And that function, that's something that cannot be automated and it cannot be outsourced. We need people of integrity, as by the way, we, we have uh, in many places in journalism to play that role. And it, it's only gonna matter more, the more raw information hits us and comes our way. Favorite question that I have of you is what do you see? Tell me what your, what your hope is for the next four years, even if Donald Trump is reelected. That's a, that's a pretty painful if, but uh, you know, my hope is that America is ready to fix what is broken at a deeper level than we have been in a long time. Uh, and that does mean structural change. Uh, you know, one of the things I, uh, I talk about in the book, we, we um, as a country, we've amended our constitution in some substantive way at an average pace of once per decade. Uh, and yet it's been about 50 years now since we've made uh, some changes. And we know some are due to get money out of politics, uh, in my opinion, to, to uh, have a national popular vote. Uh, things that would increase trust in our system and would probably increase participation, which would make the system uh, just truly more trustworthy, which in turn would increase trust. All of these things have a chicken and egg quality, and they either get better and better and better, or they get worse and worse and worse. So my hope is that the 2020s will be a decade where we get out of the negative cycle into a positive cycle, but that's going to require some very concrete and ambitious decisions about where we're going to take things. I think that probably does require a new president, but no matter who the president is, uh, it's not just about the presidents. You know from your time serving in the legislature uh, how much power our system places in, uh, in the hands of state officials, and it's, it's one of the reasons why I believe uh, in uh, finding the power in state and local office, too, because that's where a lot of this actually plays out. Yeah, and, and, and it plays out in the new generation, too. I can tell you that our leaders, whether or not it's Chuck Grassley or Mitch McConnell or whether or not it's Nancy Pelosi or uh, Jim Clyburn, et cetera. I mean, it's time that we actually get more people involved, young people of all walks of life um, involved in this political process. I think our country would be better for it. So with that being said, I want to turn now to some questions we have better uh, better uh, question askers than I. I did my best Jake Tapper impersonation. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see how well that went. I have to go to uh, Brezzi Pedreza Perez, a senior at Eastside College Prep in East Palo Alto for the first question. What are your thoughts about the Minneapolis City Council moving to dismantle the police? And is this a move that other cities should follow suit in? Well, thanks for uh, the toughest question we got right there now. <laughs> Well, and it's a timely question. And as, as you'll see, the, the city council is already finding they have to backtrack a little bit, I think, because they hadn't thought it through. Look, uh, uh, I think the human species is, is probably still at least a couple hundred years away uh, from figuring out how to live uh, in uh, cities and communities of any scale uh, without having law enforcement or something like law enforcement. 
Uh, and so we're, we're not going to be able to flip that switch and be safe. But, uh, you know, part of what led uh, Minneapolis to, to act was an awareness that the current system uh, is letting us down in a lot of ways. And so uh, part of what I think is, is most exciting are the moves that we're seeing in some cities. I think uh, Los Angeles is one that's moving in this direction. I think Minneapolis has discussed this, Albuquerque, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to do things like make sure there's an option to call in mental health resources before uh, yes. you call in uh, police rushing in with a badge and a gun. And I'll tell you, there have been a lot of situations that uh, I know uh, in South Bend happened that, that uh, wound up ending violently that might have ended otherwise if the first person on the scene was a trained mental health professional uh, instead of an officer who, uh, you know, increasingly were uh, expecting police officers to do uh, things that uh, really should be the job of somebody else and that reflect, if, if to even get the police involved, reflects a social failure. And, uh, you know, this has budgetary implications too. Uh, I think we wouldn't need uh, as much of, of some of the traditional enforcement mechanisms that we have if we were doing a better job uh, on other measures for, uh, for taking care of people uh, on every, at every level from mental health to poverty. And, uh, you know, I actually think there are a lot of uh, forward thinking people involved in law enforcement who would, who would say the exact same thing. Uh, so these are the directions that I think show enormous promise in the short term, even as we think about what it'll take in the long term for us to evolve past uh, uh, some of the uh, things that we've just assumed that, that humanity has to have because we've never known it any other way. You know, you, you just brought up a good point and something that young people do a lot to tie in kind of to, to, to my last statement that we have to reimagine what our law enforcement should look like bringing in those public health officials. And I'm pretty sure you might get a reimagined question tonight. So I hope you guys are prepared for that. Uh, the next question, uh, actually next two questions, uh, come from Abhiraj um, Muhar, who's a Foothill Community College student and student body president. Shout out to the student, county, student government presidents and student body president, I was one. Um, and the next two questions are both from Abhi. He goes by Abhi, Pete. Hi, Mayor Pete. My name is Abiraj Muhar, but please just call me Abi. Um, and I am the AFCC president on the Foothill College campus, which is basically the student government on the Foothill College campus. Um, and my question for you today kind of relates a little bit to your background and um, about how you were the first ever gay presidential candidate. And so we broke many glass ceilings by having our first ever gay presidential candidate. However, I remember during the, your campaign, there was a lot of talk about you're not gay enough or he's too gay. Um, and then there became a moment after your campaign where people started to recognize you for being a real person, for your policies, for everything beyond you being a gay person. So my question for you today is how did you break the barrier of being recognized as a person, not a gay person? Hmm. Mm. Uh, Great question, Abhi, and, uh, and, and I like that guitar you have on the wall there, too. Um, you know, uh, this is something we thought about a lot because there wasn't really a playbook to go off of. Uh, it's not just that I uh, would have been the first uh, out uh, president, but I was the first out elected official to, to even try. And so uh, uh, we, we had to find a way to, to, on the one hand, make clear that, that uh, I was running to be president for everybody. Uh, I wasn't just running to be the president of the gay United States of America. I was running to serve everybody. And at the same time, uh, to be very open uh, about the fact that, that being gay was part of who I am. Uh, being married to Chaston is a very important part of, of who I am and my story. Uh, and, uh, you know, we took a lot of pride in, in uh, the, the way we were able to hopefully uh, convey a sense of belonging uh, to others, uh, LGBTQ and, and not, um, that those who might have questioned whether they belonged or, or been made to feel like they were just taking up space uh, really did have a place in, in the future we were trying to build. And you're right, you know, we, we got it from all sides. And, and uh, uh, you know, the, the only answer I could think of to some of those criticisms was, you know, I don't think there's a right or wrong way to be gay. And, and, and the whole point of coming out is to finally just be able to be who you are. So the last thing I was going to do is come out and then go through another round of trying to, to kind of contain or, 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 um, or somehow form or fashion uh, who I was according to what other people seem to, uh, seem to expect. It's, it's exhausting to do that. And, you know, part of the experience of those who've come out is to free yourself from that, that kind of burden, that exhaustion of, of, of trying to fit yourself into, uh, into a mold that, that just wasn't made for you. 
and I think the more I was able to do that, hopefully the more people were able to, to uh, see past all that and, and have the election be maybe a little less about me and a little more about them. Uh, and the, the, the things that would change in their lives if we were able to, uh, uh, to make good on the policy ideas and the promises that I put forward as a candidate. And even though I'm now not a candidate, I'm finding other ways to, to support those, those visions and those policies and proposals, whether it's in my support of the Biden-Harris campaign and other campaigns I believe in, or through our, our uh, organization, Win the Era, or uh, in, in my writing. And uh, you know, the, just being freed from the need to, to be this kind of person or that kind of person is probably the, the, the greatest leap forward I've been able to make in, in personal life. Uh, and I, I only wish everybody uh, uh, was able to find a way to do it. And, and the more people do, the more uh, the world can expect from you and the more you have to offer. Abby actually is bringing the, the next question as well. It's actually from uh, another student, not himself. Okay. So Mayor Pete, this next question comes directly from the students themselves. And they've asked, given recent racial tension, the pandemic and the overall division of the American people, what is your vision of a just and equitable world? And what role do you see the youth playing to engage in issues to build this just and equitable world? Well, another great question. And, you know, the most important thing I, I hope young people sense is your role in shaping uh, that future. The reality is every important change that has happened socially from the end of apartheid to the civil rights movement to the American revolution itself was, was powered and driven by young people. And uh, Bakari, like you, it pains me to say it, but I'm talking about people younger than you and me. Uh, we might be younger, young in some of the rooms and uh, that we're in and the tables we sit at, but uh, I'm talking about people who sometimes are not even yet old enough to vote and yet are making a huge difference. The most visible climate activist in the world is a, is a Swedish teenager, uh, and, and that's a powerful thing. Uh, the uh, March for Our Lives changed, really did, I think, change what's possible in dealing with gun violence in this country, uh, fueled by teenagers who had, had the moral authority uh, of young people asking older people with power, what are you going to do to do a better job of keeping me safe? And I got to tell you, when somebody looks you in the eye and poses that sort of question, you stop and listen. And certainly the movement for Black Lives and the, the multiracial coalition that has uh, grown up around that, often fueled by people uh, who are very young. Um, these are the kinds of things that I think are propelling us toward what America might be. Uh, you know, we're seeing, you know, the ghost of Christmas future is here to let us know some of the things that could happen in the, in the wrong direction uh, that, that would be just so bleak, uh, a decade of American decline that would be bad news for democracy itself. But the, the other side of that coin is what we might be. And the exciting thing, especially for the, the, the generation now coming of age, uh, which has been hit with a lot. I mean, the economy you're graduating into, uh, the denial of, of some of the most experience, imp important experiences of youth as a result of the pandemic. I, I know it's rough, but the other side of that is that you get to deliver uh, one of the most consequential moments in American history. And you just might be there to see uh, a few decades from now, if things go right, if we get this right, if we create that culture of belonging in this country and back it up with policy, we would be the first full scale, fully democratic, fully pluralistic and multiracial democracy in the world. Uh, something the world has not seen at scale. If we could deliver that, that would be a powerful thing for humanity as a whole, as, as meaningful as the American Revolution itself. We'll either do it or we'll blow it in our lifetime. And I hope that is enough motivation for young people to continue leading the charge. I'm gonna take some of these questions from the YouTube chat over the next 10, uh, 12 minutes we have here. Um, Nick asked, do you have any words of encouragement or hope to the Commonwealth Club audience as we face multiple challenging crises in our country? Well, here's one way to think about it. Uh, uh, in the course of this book project, I was looking for sources of trust. How do you build up trust? And a lot of how trust is traditionally built is slowly. It's through predictable behavior over long periods of time, but we don't have a lot of time. So I started looking for ways that trust can be built in a hurry. And what I found is actually one of the best ways for that to happen is in the context of an emergency. For example, America, among the nations of the world, built up about 100 years worth of trust in three or four years by stepping up to the plate during and after World War II uh, and being a force for good in the world. Uh, and that's just one example of how the conditions of crisis 
create the possibility of trust being developed at warp speed at a more uh, immediate human scale. Uh, this is again, something I learned through service, coming to trust my life to people I had just gotten to know because we, because we had to. And then having that trust be validated over time by, by, by seeing how uh, they made choices uh, as we went forward. We're kind of in that, in that situation nationally. In some ways we're in that situation globally. Uh, the pandemic is an example. The climate crisis is another example. And so uh, I think often we think about things like the climate crisis in a framework of, of doom. And, uh, and I get it, uh, you know, smoke from where many of you are uh, in uh, California is uh, in the air here in Utah, reminding us daily uh, of what is at stake and how bad we've allowed things to get. But I think there's a possibility that when we think about, especially if we have the right leadership, when we think about things like climate, things like confronting the pandemic, things like our moral crisis around racial justice in this country, we can actually think about them in a way that makes us stand up taller uh, because we know we're doing something about it. And that could become a source of solidarity and a source of energy that could actually make this decade one of the best that America's ever seen, precisely because of the memory of what we've been up against and the chaos and the cruelty that has delivered us to this moment. We could emerge from this with something completely different. And, uh, Anyone who was alive in this moment is kind of lucky and unlucky enough to be here at, at one of these uh, chapters in history that's going to be written about for a very long time because it will decide so much about the future of the American project. Susan asked a very good question. I'm, I promise you my name is not Susan here, Pete, but Susan asked, how have you been working with Kamala to prep for tonight's debate and how have you used your knowledge of Mike Pence? <laughs> So uh, I got to make sure not to talk out of school here, but uh, what I'll say is, uh, first of all, I, I know Mike Pence well. He was uh, governor while I was mayor. And uh, especially since he joined the Trump ticket and administration, he, he's very comfortable uh, saying things with a straight face, whether they're true or not. And, and that's actually made him a very uh, effective, almost dangerous debater. Uh, but I also have gotten to know uh, Senator Harris better and better. Uh, actually, I first came to really admire her uh, paradoxically while we were competing because I just saw uh, how strong and how intelligent, how, how, uh, uh, how prepared she was. Um, but uh, I feel that at a whole new level going into tonight. And I think this is going to be a chance for her to talk directly to the American people. Uh, it's past the whole Trump Twitter noise machine to talk right to the American people about how we are all doing. And we know how we're doing is not good, but we also know that there's a better way. And I'm eager for her to describe that better way. Uh, because I think when you see it side by side, uh, and uh, and I'm hoping the moderator will do uh, whatever fact check checking is needed too, so it's not just up to Senator Harris to do it. Uh, but in any remotely truthful presentation of the contrast, it'll be pretty clear, I think, to most Americans what has to come next. What's your single biggest concern that you have about a second term for Donald Trump? Your single biggest concern? This is okay. James is asking this question. It's a good question. Yeah, pick one. I mean, we, we really are at risk of losing our grasp on a shared reality itself. It's beyond any individual policy, although the policy uh, news is so disturbing every single day. Yesterday's revelation about how the family separation policy at the border came about, um, uh, the, the decision that the president who by the way, I believe is still on psychoactive steroid medication, uh, just pulled the plug on uh, negotiations for COVID relief that's gonna make a huge economic difference to so many families and communities that I guess uh, he's no longer serious about delivering before the election. I mean, these policy choices are devastating, but also um, just the fact that we wouldn't have a president who is interested in bringing us together. I'll tell you, when you're a mayor, you come to realize that your job is not just to pass the budget and fill in the potholes and run the fire department, all the stuff the mayors are supposed to do uh, policy-wise. It's to hold a community together. It's to create the sense that the community is one community. And that's so much more so for a president. Not having that in a season of, of threats and emergencies and, and, and dangers and challenges, it just leaves America rudderless, no matter how good our governors and mayors and, and civil society are. Uh, and that's really what's at stake. Do you want to go into the next four years? Having seen just in the year 2020 what the world can throw at us, do you want to go into the next four years this divided? Uh, I think the answer couldn't be clearer. And I don't think you have to be a Democrat to believe that, which is why I just saw today another Republican leader, Michael Steele, who is the head of the RNC, uh, is joining the many Republicans who are backing Joe Biden, not because they agree with him on everything or because they've suddenly become uh, Democrats or, or liberals, but because even though they're conservatives, they know that there's only one choice to move forward right now. 
talk to us about the upcoming Supreme Court nomination. I'm interested to hear all your thoughts on this. This is Stephen's question and um, not just the nomination itself, but also the nominee, Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah, well, I've got a lot of thoughts. Uh, uh, you know, Judge Barrett and her family live uh, a few blocks from from my house, and ordinarily I would be very excited uh, for uh, South Bend once again to be the center of the political universe. But uh, I'm not really uh, as concerned about her and her family as I am about my family and what it means for us. Uh, we just saw uh, two conservative Supreme Court justices write that uh, they basically think the marriage equality decision is, is fair game to, to be overturned. At least that's what uh, seemed to be the case reading between the lines. Uh, there are members of my family whose battle with cancer pretty much depends on the Affordable Care Act being upheld. And there's an effort to kill it in the Supreme Court. Uh, that uh, could come before the court in a matter of weeks. Uh, we just learned that the Supreme Court may be hearing a very important case about a fraud investigation into the Trump organization. Um, this stuff really matters, and it's going to uh, come to a head uh, in, in uh, whether or not we see this judge take that lifetime appointment. Uh, so, uh, you know, we need to remember once again that, that these are not academic questions. These are questions that wind up coming into our lives in countless ways. In my case, even my marriage that exists by the grace of a single vote on the U.S. Supreme Court. That's all there is uh, that makes me a married man. And uh, this is so personal for so many of us in different ways, overlapping ways. And I hope that that, rather than the political circus, dominates our national conversation about what should happen next on the court. Two more questions that I have. Uh, one is a very practical question. Um, people are tuning in to tonight's debate at 9 p.m. on CNN, a random plug. Uh, do you have thoughts on how to improve the debates? Um, and is that something that will happen, should happen, I think after last week's debate? And I, I believe that a next, the next debate, the 15th in Miami, is actually a town hall conversation, if I'm That's not, right. um, yeah. which, you know, uh, individuals do vastly different in than they do in a regular um, That's standard. True. So do yeah. you have any thoughts on how to improve it um, other than just telling people who are watching it to drink more? I mean, what are your thoughts? <laughs> you know, uh, I've been in 10 presidential debates during, uh, during this cycle alone. And like so many Americans watched uh, pretty horrified uh, at the, the last debate, which you could barely even call a debate because the president wouldn't allow a conversation to happen. We can talk about and look at uh, different things that, that, that could be done, format changes, especially anything that, that would put a premium on good discussion rather than good television. Uh, but uh, I actually think we, we might be kidding ourselves if we think that a format change can do the job. Uh, speaking of trust, at the end of the day, uh, we depend on a certain level of restraint on the part of the people who are in those roles. Uh, no matter how good a moderator is, no matter what the rules are, we just expect and in some cases require uh, that the people in those roles uh, adhere to certain norms, that they just believe certain things about how humans ought to interact with each other, what a debate even is. Uh, and if they don't have that, uh, there's not a lot you can do, uh, which is why we really need to ask what's going on with our system, that it could put somebody who doesn't respect those basic boundaries uh, in a position as powerful as the American presidency. Great question. Last question I have for you, Mayor Pete. This is a question that popped up a lot. It's a question I have. Uh, what's next for Mayor Pete politically or, you know, in government? Uh, is it is it amb UN Ambassador Pete Buttigieg? Is it Secretary of State Pete Buttigieg? What's what's next for you? What role do you want to play? Um, the honest answer is that uh, it's just too soon to say. Uh, what I'll tell you is I love public service. Uh, I love serving as mayor. Uh, and uh, I would love an opportunity to, to serve in, in the future, too. Uh, but uh, right now, my focus is uh, through the next 27 days, making sure that there is a Biden-Harris administration and making sure that great uh, people get elected up and down the ticket. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm enjoying life in South Bend. I'm enjoying teaching at Notre Dame. Uh, and I'm enjoying helping these campaigns. Uh, and whatever's around the corner, uh, I only hope it'll be a chance to keep working for the, the, the things we believe in. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm excited, whether it's inside of government or outside of government, to, to keep doing that no matter what. My last question. It's an informed tradition. I answered it on the other side. I'm happy to ask it to all of our speakers who join us at this amazing event at the Commonwealth Club. Uh, we asked the following question. What is your 60-second idea to change the world? 
So uh, what's been on my mind a lot is the idea of national service. I'm not talking about forcing anybody to serve, and I'm not talking about the military. That's not for everybody. But some kind of universally shared experience where it becomes kind of a norm in our country, fully funded, so that serving for a year isn't just a luxury for the well-to-do, but something that anybody could have a chance to do if they want. The reason I think it's so transformative is not just that there's a lot of work out there waiting to be done. Uh, a climate core alone could have a huge impact on our ability to, to confront the climate crisis, doing things like weatherizing the homes of low-income seniors, making them better off, uh, making individual houses energy independent in some cases, and helping us cut, cut emissions. But that's just one example. The real reason I'm excited about this is I think every American ought to have that experience of getting to know other people radically different from themselves and learning to trust them through that unique bond of coming together to do something hard in a hurry. Uh, and I don't think people should have to go to war in order to get it. Uh, that's why I'm excited about the possibilities for service. And I hope that that gets a lot of attention as a serious proposal in the years to come. Well, uh, many thanks to my friend, Pete Buttigieg. We thank you. Everybody watching is better off for joining us, even for this 65 minutes. Author of this great book, Trust America's Best Chance by Pete Buttigieg. We encourage you to pick up a copy at your local bookstore. If you would like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth Club, please visit www.commonwealth.com club.org. My name is Bukhari Sellers. I want to encourage everyone to stay safe, wear a mask, and have an enjoyable, enjoyable debate night. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great evening. Same here. Thanks so much, Bukhari. Take care.